This is Movers and Shakers, where we interview the upcoming generation of make it happen multifamily investors to share their story. Welcome to the Movers and Shakers podcast. My name is Gino Barbara, a co-founder of Jake and Gino, multifamily investor, educator, father, mentor, and I'm joined by my co-host, my brosif, Joshua Ryan Rusin. Mr. Rusin, how are you doing today? Gino, doing well, my friend. Uh, just excited about a lot that we have going on here, making it happen, taking massive action, and uh, growing and scaling. Do you know, what, what are you excited about? That's what I want to know. Well, I just told our guest today that I'm going to have a visitor for the next week or so. So I'm, I'm stocking up. I'm getting ready. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to be able to survive for the next seven days, but I'm going to try to make it happen, Josh. Looking forward to seeing you down here in Florida for a few days. Can't wait. Excited to hop on that plane and uh, escape the, the dreary Knoxville weather we've been having lately. So, And actually, speaking of today's guest, we have Will Glothenheim. A little bit about Will. So he grew up in East Tennessee where his father and grandfather were originally in real estate. I uh, started in, in a broker or as a broker and his first six years did over a hundred million in sales. Uh, knowing the benefits of multifamily, he recently decided to pivot there and has made that a focus and actually just closed on his first deal of you know, more to come in the pipeline. So welcome to the show, Will. Yeah, thanks for having me today. Yeah. All right, Will, so you're pretty young here. Let's retrace your story. Can I, what was it like growing up in real estate, seeing that? And, and I would love to just kind of enlighten the audience about your journey. Sure. Um, so growing up in real estate, my father was a developer, um, worked, did a lot of auctions, built homes. Um, he's done uh, condos and hotels and big stuff like that. Uh, but I went to school at the University of Tennessee, graduate physics major. I worked at Amazon, then quit Amazon, came back home to Knoxville and started a real estate company um, just because of the entrepreneurial aspect of it. And that's kind of like a telltale, same kind of thing with uh, getting into the multifamily is being able to work for yourself and scale and you, you are what you make it type thing. What do you like about real estate? I like real estate. It's, it's very merit based. If that makes sense. Um, you get, like I said, you get out of it, what you put into it. The only per if you fail, the only reason for that is the person looking back at you in the mirror. I mean, it's no one else's fault. You can't look externally. You have to look internally. Um, and I thrive in that kind of environment uh, and the corporate environment is hard because there's a lot of out external factors that you can't control as far as like scaling and growing and, you know, creating a better position for yourself and promotions and stuff. But in real estate, like I was a 28 year old kid starting it and was the top five broker in th the first three years in my marketplace just because we worked really, really hard. Um, and I think you apply that same thing over to multifamily is acquiring it, managing it, and just working harder and pushing the envelope. Um, and you create a really cool lifestyle for you and your family. And that's kind of my why is my family. That's why I quit Amazon and got well, in. Really let's dissect that. So you were crushing in Amazon, managing 500 plus employees and to take a, it, it's a risk, right? A leap in entrepreneurship to build oh, yeah. your business. What influenced that decision to leave the corporate path? And then what were some of your keys to success as you were scaling up the brokerage? And then, how, you know, because that's not the average person's results when they take a, a yeah. that leap. I think most people are, are hindered by the fear of the financial aspect of leaving something that's continually streaming in right as far as like a job um but that's why i mentioned you know a lot of the corporate speakers or whatever they say find your why like i think that it has to be a lot more about a lot less about money and a lot more about like who you are as a person what you want to achieve as this one shot you got on this planet kind of thing um and then not caring about anything else obviously working hard and doing everything you can but I like I've never been worried about money not because I have money it's just because I, I just that's not something I worry about I worry about doing what's right and working hard and fulfilling and doing fulfilling things and such um, but yeah I mean absolutely is I was uh, a, a, the tier six manager with Amazon which for my age was a really rare thing to see um, so it was a it was a pretty substantial uh, position that I was leaving to jump into I lived in my parents basement in-laws basement for 13 months with my wife moving back to Knoxville and, and couldn't even buy a house because I had no income and everything. So it's like, I went from like a really good spot to absolutely nothing. Um, but now what we use this real estate has turned into more than anything you could ever imagine for Amazon. Um, but it kind of really had to take some lumps to get there. So it's funny, Will, the fear of loss holds people back a lot more than the chance for gain. 
So you 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 lost a great position at Amazon, but you saw the gain possibility. How did you trick your mind into doing that? Because I've lived in my mom's basement twice. I wish I could still live there right now. Be pain. I had a twenty dollar back twenty years ago. I had like a twenty dollar phone bill a month. I was like in heaven, bro. I wish I could go back. So, um, how did you get over the fear of loss? Because I'm sure a lot of people say you're crazy, and, and I want everyone else out there to think about this. Just because you have a W-2 job doesn't mean that you don't have risk. Everyone has that thing that they have money streaming in. Something can happen to Will. He could get disabled. Amazon could start having cutbacks. Anything can happen. Nothing is uh, you know, concrete set in stone. So how did you get over that fear of loss and say, you know what, I can see the possibility? Sure. Um, a lot of it's like, if, like in the spirit, I mean, even in my spiritual life with my relationship with the Lord, um, comfort is the enemy in a lot of ways because you mm -hmm. get lackadaisical um, and soft and then the things start working in that shouldn't be. So I try not to make my decisions based on the comfort level. And obviously it's very comfortable getting a paycheck and obviously they're, and so it's hard. Everyone's different. If I had five kids like you and I was running a restaurant, I probably couldn't just shut the restaurant down and go hope to make it a multifamily because I got to feed my kids. So everyone's situation is different, but it wasn't comfortable doing what you had to do. And it was not comfortable doing what I had to do. Um, but I had the support of my wife. That was the first and foremost. I couldn't mm -hmm. do that her. Um, so I had the backing of my family. My father decided to support me. Like he said, he would start the real estate company with me because um, we started it from scratch when I came up to Knoxville. So I made sure like my core circle of influence that I really care about had my back. Um, and then from there, I didn't, I didn't care what all the other noise was. Um, and that's kind of the similar thing like getting in the multifamily. It's just kind of one of the aspects of us trying to reach it out because a we can create great living situations for folks and also we can create more financial freedom for my personal situation and my family. Mm -hmm. i love that so what made you join jake and gino what what said to yourself that i need to join this com this group this community to take it to the next level with multifamily sure uh, so i i'm i'm no stranger to real estate deals i'm an rv park we got assisted living that we're uh, that's built just opened this month Knoxville's largest in Tennessee. We built homes. I bought land and flipped it and developed it. So I've done a lot in real estate. So, but I know enough about real estate to know I don't know enough about certain aspects. So all of those ventures always had key key man partners who lived and breathed that entire world. So that was one of the reasons I want to get in with you guys is because I don't want to pretend like I know everything and just having the value of the coaches and you guys' asset, even if it's just a forty second phone call to run something by you, is worth every bit for what we paid to be in the group um, because it's, I, th I think it's great. I, you need someone that you trust to help guide you through that process. Even if it's just one little thing, that one little thing can make all the difference in the world. So it's amazing. Everybody out there, write this down. Will was an RV land assisted living, single family homes, over a hundred million dollars in transactions, top broker, and he knew enough to say, you know what? I need somebody out there that is in this specific niche because every niche is different in real estate, right? Well, there's certain different things, whether it's going into due diligence, whether it's trying to increase the income on the property, whether it's property managing. What, what differences do you see in multifamily or have you learned over the last six months with Jake and Gino that are prevalent and they're not in the other uh, niches of multifamily? Does well, anything of, stand out? Yeah, a lot of the due diligence for multifamily is a lot different. Mm -hmm. uh, because you're buying sometimes massive running, basically operating businesses and being able to vet and go through and say, hey, they're all this operating cost, I'm calling BS on that, Bill Ham's great with that stuff. Or like, hey, there, here's an opportunity here, you need to be able to scale this here. Well, a, one deal, um, we actually, Bill talked us out of doing it. We went into it completely blind and he helped us like, because some deals are blind deals, mom and pops off market, Hey, this is what I make. I think, and you don't really. You're basically buying on a performer. So if you buy on a performer, how do you analyze it? So like all those little things. Because I was telling my partner Patrick, and he couldn't make the call. I'd rather do no deals than do a bad deal. So um, I hear all these story war stories from you guys, like all these bad deals you all have done. It's like that's great and all, but I don't want to be. I do not want to make a bad deal. Mm -hmm. So having y'all's experience and saying, hey, I've made these bad deals before. Don't make this mistake. Is all was huge. Well, let's talk about that deal because you were at the boot camp in Atlanta. I spent some time with you there the two day weekend. Bill Ham was teaching it. We talked about the buy right. We talked about the market cycles. We talked about the underwriting. We even talked about partnerships. 
remind me about that deal because I remember you talking about it and there was a lot of meat on the bone, but there was a lot of risk because you had to take this thing over basically. And what did Bill really enlighten you about? What did he say? You know what? Let's take a look back at this and let's really dive into this deal. Yeah, during that Atlantic conference, we were actually under contract with it and it fell apart about 10 days after that. Um, so we we're right in the middle of it. Um, and uh-huh. Bill tell us not to buy it. He just need to consider these things. And one of the main things was a really heavy lift. We have to completely unoccupy an entire building, build new decks. It was about a $400,000 lift. Mm-hmm. My partner and I were doing it all ourselves. So we weren't syndicating or doing anything like that. Um, so, and then one of the things like, well, well, yeah, once we get it here, it's going to be great. But how long does it take to get you there? And then at what point does it take? And these are the questions Bill's asking. What's your break even point? How many units do you have to have leased? And how much money and time will it take you to get just a break even point? So we ran that calculation and realized how much money we actually lost, like mm-hmm. air lost in between the ramp period. So that's where we're looking at. It's like, okay, well, even if this is a super, super long term play, are we going to eat 85 grand to ramp it? Mm-hmm. Um, and how long will it take to recruit that as opposed to? buying another property that's just in there in a small lift, you know, so we decided to make a decision instead of looking at how sexy the numbers were on the back end, like what did it actually take us to get there? And we knew an idea of it, but like actually having just Bill asking three questions helped us think a little bit differently. He didn't even really tell us anything. He just asked these questions like, oh, dang. Yeah, so right. is it safe to say that three questions saved you about 85 grand? Is that, is that what I'm hearing right then and there? I think it saves a lot of time and headache, right? Because we would have made it more if I stuck with it for whatever reason. But yeah, you could look at it that way. I, <laughs> I think neither of us have had heartburn about not closing on that deal. But if it wasn't for Bill, we'd have closed on it and we'd be stuck with it right now. And um, because we're all excited about it. And, and that's, but, but Will, that's not a bad thing, but that might not be the right deal for your first or second deal. That may be yeah. a, a sixth or seventh deal when you're down the road, you have a lot more experience. You may have a CapEx crew. You may say, you know what? I can, I can take a hit for a little bit. I've got some extra cash sitting around. Or that might be a deal where you syndicate and you tell your investors, we need to, we need to raise a little extra capital. So it's, it's all that thing. That may not be for your first or second deal. So I, t- I totally, totally agree with that. Now you've closed. Three from us, we probably would have done it. But it, again, another thing was like 15 minutes <laughs> Away and it's like, ah, you know, it's just compounded. So mm-hmm. that's awesome. So you closed on a first deal. What was this first deal and how did you find it? And what did you like about this first deal? This relationship, um, it was just through a guy who knew a guy who knew we were real estate in real estate kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. just a little eight unit deal, all brick, uh, brick interior. It was brick built. It's not stick built. It was built by bricks. It's like, it's wow. pretty um, so it was really easy, low maintenance. Um, we, so we've already rented all the units out. We've already raised rent over $200 a unit on the two units we came out. So it was very undermanaged. Um, our financing was ridiculous. We literally got 100% financing on a 25-year AM with a 4% interest rate. So I got wow. a check at closing to buy that property. <laughs> So it's funny. Everyone out there says there's no deals. There's no deals. What I'm hearing is it's relationship based business. First of all, the second thing is the three step proprietary framework works buy right, manage right, and finance right. You've nailed all three of those. You bought that right on the front end. You bought a really sounds like a really good asset with a little bit of different maintenance. You managed it properly because you've gotten the rents up. You've got the management efficiencies and the finance aspect of it sounds awesome because you've got some great debt on there. What is what other value adds are you going to do? Are you going to refire this thing out again, or what, what's the what's the uh, future look for this deal? For this deal in particular, I don't really know. It kind of depends on how the world looks we're planning on every penny we get we just put back into it pay the note down not take anything out of it um and if we find another deal we need some money for maybe we'll fly out or sell or something right now um but our goal my partner and i is more of a jake and gino model of you know 20 years from now we want a thousand units that are just rolling and rolling and rolling and paying debt down and like a legacy so, Will, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think you need 20 years to get a thousand units. Uh, it took us a lot less, and we knew a lot less. You've you've been in the business. You're in a great market. You're going to see the market cycles going up and down. And this eight unit, you, what's amazing is you're 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 going to evolve. You're going to say, oh, I can start syndicating, or I can start bringing in partners. Oh, I can start refining this deal out right now. When I first started in real estate, I wanted to pay notes down also, but then I saw the power of leverage and I saw the ability to refinance these properties and to scale up and not to over lever the property still have 75 to 80% leverage. So what, what is your next deal? What are you looking for in this next property that you're going after? Um, the, 
I think it's just the right opportunity because I tell my bankers, I tell my relationships and stuff, there's no deal too big. There's no deal too small. We offered, I told you on a triplex today. Mm -hmm. um, and I told you as well, we're working on a 150 unit deal, loose working on it um, in the Knoxville area. But I would need you guys to like help me. And that's another thing about joining you guys. Is like I could take down a 150 unit deal and have no, no qualms about it because I know people with the money. I know the people who can manage it and analyze the deal and close on it, even though mm -hmm. if I can't being part of the group five months close 150 unit deal you know what i mean mm -hmm. so like I, i'm not nervous about putting a 10 million dollar deal under contract like i'm just not just like you guys guys that we back out and if it's good we do it you know so i think that's another huge asset to have like expertise in your corner you guys would eat up 150 unit deal you'd love to look at it mm -hmm. for sure so that's kind of our next thing is just whatever the best opportunity we have we'll run across it Good. I love that. Before we get to the short answers, I just want to ask you, um, what else have you learned? What else have you taken away from the community and just from your education in multifamily as far as what, maybe why do you like it a lot more or, you know, what are the benefits or what are the aha moments you've had? Like, wow, this makes total sense to me now. Um, well, so I've been considering it for a couple of years. My partner and I have, um, but again, we didn't, we knew enough to know we didn't know enough. Uh, I don't know if there's any in particular aha moment, um, but I think a lot of the tools you guys have, like that one, that underwriting spreadsheet you guys have, I'm like married to it. I like, I play with it probably four or five days a week, <laughs> like just punching stuff in there. It's just a real good snapshot and I can tell whether or not really clearly is this just a crap deal or a good deal. There's so, there's a thousand different moving parts. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit most interesting. Now you can analyze them really quick. So that tool in itself, I sent that to my banker that I got the 100% financing on. He goes, well, I haven't seen anything so awesome in my life. This is awesome. I'm going to take this to the president. Imagine this, we got the thing. And I was like, yeah, that's right. I ended up <laughs> guessing that it wasn't, I didn't build the spreadsheet. But. <laughs> hey, rip off and duplicate. Well, I want to ask you though, the credibility book, you need to have a credibility book. Did you make a credibility book yet? No. Oh, I got I to gotta hook you up with the credibility book because you've got great credibility. You've got the eight unit. You've gonna, you're going to get that three unit on the, con, on, the, on the contract. You've done other deals out there. So, Josh, we've got to get him to create his credibility book. I want to ask you this one more question before, we go, before short answers also. What made you consider so long? I mean, there's a lot of students out there who are like, you know what? I'm not sure if I can do it. You've got the credibility because you've been in the space for so long. You've, been in, in, you've done other deals, RV and assisted living. What made you wait so long to get into multifamily? I think a lot of it uh, for my situation, um, it wasn't hesitancy. It's just I had a lot, I have a lot going on, mm -hmm. right? It's just timing for me and everything. Um, a lot of it was, I just didn't know and I didn't have anyone to help me. And so the only reason we jumped into it is because I texted my partner, Patrick, I go, um, Hey, do you want to buy some multifamily? He goes, yeah, I'll go call Jake. He lives down Chota road with y'all. And then we texted him and then we had it, got it all set up. And there we go, because we didn't have anyone to guide us. So that, mm -hmm. that is awesome. Let's take a quick time out to hear from our sponsors. Gino and I are super excited to tell you about the audiobook version of The Honeybee, which was recently released. The Honeybee tells the story of Noah, a disappointed, disaffected salesman who feels like his life is going nowhere until the day he has a chance encounter with a man named Tom Barnum, the beekeeper. In his charming, down-home way, Tom, the bee man, teaches Noah and his wife Emma how to grow their personal wealth using the lessons he learned from his beekeeping passion. In the audio version, Gino and I sat down for an exclusive interview after each each chapter where we elaborate on the stings we felt throughout the business, the importance of scaling up, and how we've been able to create multiple streams of revenue. For more information and to get your copy of the audiobook, visit jakeandgino.com forward slash honey. Well, I got some short answer questions here for you. So what's your favorite book you've ever read and why? My favorite book? Oh my gosh. Oh, geez. Uh... This Present Darkness. All right, never heard of that one. Tell me about it. Uh, it's, it's, it's a Frank Peretti novel. It's like a, it has to do with like uh, angels and demons and like spiritual warfare and stuff like that. And it's all a fictional kind of thing, but it's kind of, I like that kind of stuff. It's just entertaining and intriguing to me. So it's not a, not a business book or anything like that. So sorry to let you down. So Frank Peretti, he sounds like a guy who makes pizza. He doesn't sound like a writer, to be honest with you, because Italians... <laughs> so he doesn't sound like a writer. Italians really can't write. We can cook and we can eat. I don't know about writing. So uh, Josh, what do you think? <laughs> he, almost, he almost sounds like Andretti to me. He's a race car driver. That's where I go with it. So, 
All right, Will, what about your best habit for success? I mean, at your age, you have a tremendous track record. You've dominated W2, brokerage, you know, different industries. Best habit to make all this happen? Best habits. Um, I'm not inherently an habitual type person, right? Um, I, when I train my team, I got over 20 people on my team in our brokerage firm. So it's good to have long, short-term goals. I know it's a short answer, but basically I just look, I look no more than eight hours in front of me. I just, what am I doing now? What am I doing next? How's my day looking? And I just every single day I just push and grow. I don't have a wake up schedule because I got into being an entrepreneur because I wanted to be flexible. Like I'm in Florida right now. I was telling them we booked it on Sunday and showed up on Monday morning just because we wanted to, you know, and I'm still working and doing stuff. So I don't, I'm not a super habit guy. I think a lot of it's just your mindset and being persistent. Mm -hmm. The answer your question, persistence. If you can label it to one number, stay persistent. As a really long show. All right. I love that. Okay. So there's been some really good golden nuggets in this episode. Uh, I want to go over a few of them. I, I think Will hit something that we didn't really dive into, uh, but he talked about, he wasn't really worried about money, but he was worried about his actions and the merit of them. So when you really look at it, money is actually a byproduct of your actions. So if you can focus on the actions and have a, a operating system or core values for those, going to produce that result, which is money. Um, another one, it's, it's not what you know you don't know that gets you hurt, but actually what you don't know you don't know is what's most dangerous. And the moment you have a, a fixed mindset or you stop growing usually gets you in trouble, right? So the takeaway for me, when we went to, we had a money mixer last year, um, and even Jake came away with some takeaways on that one that was in Nashville. Uh, so it's like even these guys who I look up to tremendously still realize they don't know it all and there's room to grow and get better so love 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 that Gino what do you have to add to that um J Josh there's a lot here the environment is really important who you surround yourself is really important every day so if you want to get into assisted living find people who are doing that Will has a lot of track record RV land assisted living single family homes I had mentioned all that just because you're really good at one area one niche and you want to, you want to develop another one. Don't be afraid to go out there and get coached. Don't be afraid to go out there and invest in your education because it's going to come back tenfold for you. You know, also will it's will is going to be working on very soon. He's got it right now is the multifaceted aspect of real estate where he's going to be creating multiple streams of revenue from these assets. And he's going to have that really beautiful symbiotic relationship where he's got the brokerage going on. He's going to start syndicating, raising money for these deals, maybe possibly managing these properties. So, it's, it's, he's got a really amazing future ahead of him. Josh, uh, what else you got? Because there's a lot of stuff in here. I mean, we can continue on this story because what I love about it is we'll join the community. He went and he started, he jumped in head first and he took a couple look at a couple of deals and he didn't pull the trigger and he's continuing to get the deal flow. He's, and he's not afraid to start small. Think big, but start small. A three unit, if it makes sense, let's buy that asset right now and let's continue to look. And you know what? 150 units comes my way, I'll figure it out. That's what I like about it. It's all about commitment and persistence. That's a great combination right there. Yeah, one more to add to that. When Will first started to make the leap, he looked at his circle and he made sure everyone there was supportive. I, I think that's- Yes. Weird. Uh, that was something I definitely didn't have when I first started this, right? A lot of my friends, family were like, that's risky. What are you doing? Um, and, and now on the other side, getting results, obviously they're, they're supportive because they see it. However, early on, they didn't understand it. So they justified it as scary. So really, really love that. You know, Will, how can the listeners get a hold of you? Um, you can email me. Um, that's probably the best way. Or you Facebook me. My name's really goofy if you try to look me up on Facebook. Spelled G L A F E N H E I N from Glockenheim, Will Glockenheim. Uh, but my email is W I L dot G at honorsproperties.com. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you for being an amazing guest on the show and sharing your movers and shakers story. Now, if you want to be the next movers and shakers guest, email us, josh at jakeandgino.com. And if you like the show, please leave us a review. And until next time, let's make it a movers and shakers week. See you, everybody. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Josh. Yeah. Take care, everybody.